morning guys, good morning. How you doing? Hope you're doing good. Today is a big day for two reasons. It is currently my 10th anniversary on YouTube. Today signifies 10 years of YouTube for me, which is... How's it going? You good? Yeah, yeah. Oh my god, I met you like three years ago on your yeah. first book signing. Oh, nice. In London. Thank Sick. you. Nice to see you. Have a fun day in London. Cheers, and you. 10 years on YouTube today. But something even more special is about to add to this. We currently just arrived at King's Cross and Pancras Station in London. And we are on the way to YouTube slash Google headquarters. Uh, let's go this way. Uh, to go and film a video. I've tweeted about it, I've insta-storied about it, I've put it on private Facebook groups with like 200 creators on it, about it, but I haven't been allowed to say who. Today I'm filming with the CEO of YouTube, Susan herself. Let's sit down and chat before we go in. I reached out to my YouTube partner manager, a woman called Vivian, who is unbelievable, and I said, look, I really, really want to shoot a sit-down, in-depth video with Robert Kinsel or Susan, who's the CEO, Robert's chief business officer, to chat about everything to do with the platform because I see so much, not negativity, but so many things that creators and viewers would like to be tweaked or changed or like, what is the answer to this? Why is this happening like this? That I was like, I just want to sit down with one of the two. Susan's never really done this before. Robert's done it a couple of times with people like Casey and Casper. Somehow, we've managed to catch Susan while she's in London. Oh, <laughs> this is crazy. She's on a family holiday. She's literally got her five kids here with her at the moment. And she's taken time out of her day, which I super appreciate, to come down to the YouTube space and record this video with me. So I'm incredibly thankful. The topics I'm looking to cover, I want this video to cover every aspect of every part of the community. So many videos that YouTubers like myself have done with people that are super senior at, at YouTube get quite a lot of backlash for not covering the right topics. I promise you I've done as much as I can. I've asked on Twitter, I've asked on Instagram, I've asked on Facebook, I've asked on private groups, I've asked my friends, I've asked so many people from all different parts of the community, people that I don't even know personally I've reached out to. LGBTQ plus creators, gaming creators, cooking YouTube channel, like everybody. And the, the topics, I mean, we're gonna cut to it and see in a second, but the topics I'm looking to cover are demonetization, harassment, trending page, mental health, and then just loads of other random topics. Specifically, one of the most popular questions that I've been asked to ask is about demonetization of LGBTQ plus content. Definitely gonna cover that, but there is so much to talk about. I wanna know Susan's opinion on Instagram, getting rid of the likes. I wanna know Susan's thoughts on what she would change if she rebuilt YouTube again. We're just, we're gonna go in as much as I'm allowed to go in. We've got 16 minutes to be literally just there. I bloody hope this goes well, guys, because I want this to be amazingly beneficial for creators to just get answers to questions that we've all wanted to know, but also YouTube voice and answer the answers to questions that they want the answers to be public. I'm gonna do my best. Let's just see what happens. I'm just gonna film everything, everything I possibly can. They've also got, out of ease, like a really swanky, posh setup set up in there already, we haven't seen it yet. Um, I just got told about it, I don't know what the set looks like. I did offer just a film with me and Morgan on this camera, but I think, I mean, Susan's time is unbelievably valuable, so we've just got to get the process as smooth as possible. The camera's already all set up, the mic's already set up, everything like that. Um, yeah, that's the plan for today. It's a bloody big day, 10 years. I wish I had like a party popper to pop or like a little champagne glass to cheers. Um, the sport's been unbelievable. 10 bloody years. Who would have thought 10 years ago, I'd be sitting down on the 10 year anniversary with the CEO of the actual company. What the bloody heck? What the heck? You should roll it. Yeah. Right, you've got to just roll that camera. We're going to try and film the whole process, everything. No, you have. I have. Well, I mean, the last one I was here, Susan was here. Yeah. Yeah. True. In that room at the end, yeah. Oh, this is awesome. So we try to keep it low key. It looks yeah. good, but it's not overproduced, like, you know, basic props side by side.
One, A camera mark, B camera mark, T camera mark. First of all, appreciate you coming down on your family holiday. Of course, glad to be here. What have you been up to? Um, checking out London. I was here for the hottest day ever on record. Yeah. Um, it was really hot and um, enjoying the parks and the museums and um, also just here meeting with creators, which has been great too. So thank you for taking time. I know today is actually a really important day for you. So 10 years ago today, I uploaded my first video on YouTube, uh, which is possibly the most embarrassing video on YouTube. I thought, I thought your hair was a hat. <laughs> yeah, Susan, Susan got me a present earlier on. <laughs> Uh, when we first met, and this one here is a photo of me from the first video of mine, which you thought my, my hair I was a hat. I thought that was a hat. I was like, why did you wear a hat? And you said, no, it's my hair. Yeah, my hair, this is like Justin Bieber style, like super low down, but the camera quality is so bad, it does look <laughs> like a hat. And then over here, this is like most recent up to date me. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I should put these in the, in the back over here. Okay. I'm glad that just magically worked out that I could be here with you on your to celebrate your 10 years on YouTube. Mm, this is what I said to my girlfriend earlier. I was saying, imagine if I thought back then when filming the first ever video that in 10 years time to the day, we're sitting down with the CEO of YouTube. Well, I'm glad it worked out. I no, appreciate what it. What inspired you for your first video? Just while we're, while we're on the topic, I'd love to hear, <laughs> I'd love to hear the story about how creators first got started yeah and so what inspired you for that first video I think it was boredom of I was home alone I got my little family holiday camera mm -hmm. like put it on a stack of books mm -hmm. still not even too different to what I do now and um, yeah I don't even know I, I kind of feel like I I don't remember the whole video because I'm too embarrassed to watch it every time someone I plays a clip I'm like no, no 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 I thought we should watch it I thought it'd be fun to watch it together Okay, we can watch a bit of it. We can watch it. But we're going to watch the same amount that every time it gets to it, I'm like, okay, let's turn this off. Because it's just, even my voice is... See my hat here. So I'm reviewing another YouTuber in the first okay. video. Do you know Charlie? Okay. Charlie's so cool like. Uh -huh. So I'm reviewing his video and talking about how much okay. I like his videos as my first video. Okay, let's see a little more. What are you saying? I don't even know what I'm saying. I just, I've just i been this close to deleting it, but then I'm also like, I can't delete it because it no, needs you to stay to there because it. then you can see the difference. Then you it's have like, to keep it yeah. for the history and for your for your 20 year anniversary. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, no, I appreciate you coming down and doing this. And um, I suppose, first of all, number one for working, creating such a unbelievable platform that makes creators want to be on it for 10 years, 10 years long, like there's not many places that people, communities that people would want to be involved in for that period of time. In previous videos that I've seen with like YouTube execs, a lot of the comments always say like, ah, oh, have the, has the exec seen the questions before? So I just wanted to make it clear that to everybody watching that you have seen like the questions before, but I want to make sure that yeah. this is very casual. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, and I think we were open to any question yeah, that you yeah, have. Definitely. We want to hear, oh, I want to hear no from you. No questions have been rejected, no questions have been tweaked or anything, do you know what I mean? Yeah. For sure. But I just want to make that clear because some videos I've seen people are like, oh, you obviously didn't ask this for this. And I'm like, nothing like that. I has will happened. tell you I didn't spend a long time preparing. Um, <laughs> I mean you're literally on holiday at the moment. I, I have with, been busy. I have been doing a lot of <laughs> meetings. I've done yeah. a lot of dinners. Yeah. Um, I just did a press interview. So I, I don't I didn't spend a huge amount of time preparing for your questions. For sure. People the, will but, like that. But, People will like but that. on the other hand, and part of the reason I didn't is is just, just to be upfront about it, is because in a sense my job is to always um, be answering questions about YouTube, right? Sure. And to know what's on people's minds and to be able to explain what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And so um, so I, I look at the questions just to see, is there something here that I've never seen before? Yeah. And sometimes when I go to a new country, they're asking something that's very specific to the country that is not a global issue, but is super important in that country. Yeah. And I might not have the full context, but in general questions about YouTube and how YouTube functions in general and decisions that are global are things that um, I usually just look at it and I say, yeah, yeah, I've already talked about it. I've spent a lot of time on it. I've been in reviews about it. I've met with the product people about it. I've met with creators about it. Um, and I can tell you where we are in that process to create 
a to, to address that issue or also to explain like why are people confused about it sometimes we have addressed it but Definitely. the communication hasn't been clear so anyway no, so so please ask yeah. me what's on your mind i want to yeah. hear your questions no, and, definitely. and try to have a really open honest conversation and because i think one of the things that we've seen is that youtube is this um at the scale that we operate it is com it is complex and we and so there are a lot of questions and there are a lot of people making their livelihood on youtube and we and they have a lot of questions and we want to make sure we're communicating about what we're doing and why we're doing what we're doing and and we're really we, we hear we hear from creators that we need to be more transparent yeah. and we are working hard to communicate more, um, like doing an interview like this, um, answering questions on social. Um, we're putting updates now in Creator Studio um, where people, where our creators go to see yeah, their yeah, yeah, stats. Sure. So we're trying to be transparent and communicate more. I definitely think it's working for sure because one thing that shocked me is prior to this interview, I told everybody on Twitter, I told everybody on Instagram, I told everybody in a private Facebook group that I have of like 185 creators from mm -hmm. the UK. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't specifically say film with you, I just said uh, an exec at YouTube. There was so many less questions than what I thought. Mm -hmm. And at first I was like, this is really strange. I don't know why people aren't like coming forward with the questions. And then I'm, the more I think about it, the more is I'm like, maybe YouTube's already answering them themselves. And like proactively putting them in places where creators can see it is actively working and it must be because I put it out to a Facebook group with 185 creators and I got two questions and one was so niche and specific to the creator that I was like I don't think Susan's the right person for this. <laughs> like this isn't the right question for Susan um, so I definitely think that is 100% working for sure because there was far less noise from me actively putting out saying that I'll be sitting down with somebody I thought I was going to be bombarded with like Tweak this, <laughs> fix this, change this, and it was literally the opposite. Well, that's good to hear. Yeah. We, we know that we still need to make sure that we're working on communication, and I don't think we're done at all. Um, but we are, we are working hard to communicate more. And what we are seeing, for example, so we some we do meetings with creators, and I'm seeing a lot more. We have um, lots of we met here in London. Yeah, so we, yeah. we meet we meet here. I was it was great to meet with some creators here in London, and and but YouTube as a whole, we're trying to do a lot more outreach and programs and meeting with creators and actually I'm seeing a lot more um, like technical support when we meet with creators. They're not philosophical questions. Yeah. There are a lot of times like I have an account and I had this issue specifically to my account. Um, and again, we're trying to make sure we address those too, but, but um, and we'll continue. I mean, we, we the, YouTube is a dynamic platform, issues change and, yeah. and we expect that there will be um, new topics that come up and we'll always be trying to communicate but I just want you to know and your followers to know that we are we have heard that we need to be doing more to be transparent and we're working hard to do yeah. that I definitely and we still have work to do I think you are I think okay. you are I think it's been good um, first thing I thought would be good to start on was the four core pillars of YouTube mm -hmm. freedom of opportunity freedom of speech freedom of information freedom to belong can you explain those to people? Because I don't think many people will know about that. And sure. I've only learned that from being a YouTube creator summits. Okay, great. Um, so um, we spent time thinking about what was YouTube's mission. And um, because I think it's really important to be a mission-driven company. And at YouTube, our goal is um, to give everyone a voice and to show them the world. And that's a mission that we spent time thinking about. And in that process of, of creating that mission, um, we wound up having these four freedoms that came out of all of our discussion. And the freedoms were um, freedom of information, right? The fact that anybody can watch a video and get information about pretty much anything. And YouTube is this incredible library now of how to fix your dishwasher. Anything, dishwasher. anything, anything, right? Fixing your dishwasher, <laughs> learning math, like um, learning an instrument. Um, and so then the next one was freedom of expression, that we want to enable everyone to have a voice and to be able to communicate what's happening for them. And we've seen you to be able to cover so many topics that were never covered before, um, whether people are talking about um, their challenges or having a disability or having a disease or having a passion that is shared by a small set of people. So um, freedom of expression. Um, then we've also talked about the freedom to belong, at which 
is that anyone can find someone like them on the platform. Um, and like, no matter what your background is, um, your where you came from, like what challenges you have, you can find someone who's like you on YouTube and connect. And that is really powerful for us and something that we are always trying to celebrate and encourage. Um, and then also the last one is freedom of opportunity, which is that anyone can start a business. Um, and it, it used to be that, I mean, you started your website, right? When 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, and so this story that people a lot of times will share, which is that I wanted to have a media company or I wanted to, to be in media and entertainment and I tried and I went about a number of traditional routes and it didn't work out and I tried YouTube and I was able to have an audience. And um, I look at creators and I talk about creators as next generation media companies. Now sometimes these freedoms come in conflict and I think you wanted to ask me about that. Yeah. Um, one question that I, sure. the number one sure. most popular question that I got to ask that sure. comes touches a little bit on that sure. is the amount of LGBTQ plus content that is instantly demonetized on YouTube, um, any content that's based on sexuality or sex, mm -hmm. and how that doesn't contradict with the freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. So we do not automatically demonetize LGBTQ content because I've had rumors like have the word lesbian in your tag for your thumbnail or your title instant flag um, so we work incredibly hard to make sure that our systems are fair um, we have a ML fairness initiative ML stands for machine learning um, to make sure that our algorithms and the way that our machines work are fair um, there is no policy uh, of course of course, because we want to have um, all different voices representing all different points of view on our system and we want them uh, on our platform. And, and um, just backing up for a minute, I mean, the LGBTQ community has been an incredibly important part of YouTube. Sure. Um, we have so many creators who have come from that community and um, we also have seen that um, we and are really proud that we have been able to um, assist so many youth who otherwise might have felt more isolated to be able to have a better understanding and connection to the to LGBTQ communities. So very early in YouTube's life, we had a um, It Gets Better campaign um, that was a very significant campaign that um, had to that was addressing LGBTQ youth and suicide, and it was. Um, it was a, um, a large number of, of people on YouTube who came out and said, it, life gets better yeah, yeah. and created videos. Um, and right now we actually see that we have a lot of, lot of coming out videos um, coming out on, on YouTube. Yeah. Um, and we've been really proud of that. And so we want to support the LGBTQ community. Um, and so you know, there's no policies that say if you put certain words and the title that that will be demonetized. Um, we work incredibly hard to make sure that when our machines learn something, um, because a lot of our decisions are made algorithmically, that our yeah. machines are fair. Um, and we have a whole committee and a whole process to make sure that we are managing fairness of how our algorithms work. So um, there's no like flag words from specifically that community that is like more likely to be demonetized. There shouldn't be. There no. shouldn't be. Okay. No. Th that's just that's mm -hmm. the number one question, mm -hmm. piece of feedback that I got from creators and viewers from Twitter and stuff like that was mm -hmm. a lot of the LGBT content just getting demonetized. Um, and people wanting to know why and how, but there is nothing that's... I mean, I want to... Be sensitive to people who have those concerns and we always enable people to appeal mm -hmm. um, any kind of demonetization yeah. decision and so again I, I'm you know it always comes down to the specific video and what was in the video and sure. what happened in the video and I want to be sensitive to people who are saying like those were experiences that they had um, but we always offer an appeal process we always look back and understand are there and we're always trying to make sure that whatever false 
um, positives we had um, are reviewed, right? So the, the more we, um, so basically what we do is when, the, the more we can um, identify the, co the content that um, is truly violative of our community guidelines and, um, and consistent with our community guidelines, and we can be really clear about that, the better and better our algorithms become and more precisely sure. become. And we keep updating our numbers in terms of how much better we've become in this area. And again, I'm not saying like we still don't have room to grow and ways to be better, um, but we do work um, really hard to see if our systems have made a mistake. And if they have, then we work to retrain it. Um, and so again, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, 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 anyone who's asking that, um, it's important that they are appealing, um, but but we have looked into it, and there is no policy against it. In fact, we have done the opposite, which is like we have explicitly created systems and people and processes to look in to make sure our systems are fair. Okay, that's perfect. Yeah, and I I thought that was the case in terms of recently I had a video that got nearly demonetized, mm -hmm. and there was six physical staff from YouTube reviewed it. That's what I got told. And I was like, that's awesome. YouTube should be shouting about that. The six manual people reviewed the video to see whether it should get monetized or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was monetized, which is good. That's good. Um, but I think that's awesome that there's real humans reviewing content after mechanic decisions. We do. Uh, yeah. Yes, there are lots of humans. So we have, overall, Google has about 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. Uh, that we're using on content decisions. So there are lots of people. Um, to, you know, to be fair, not all of them. Okay. <laughs> Good one. Nice little music break. <laughs> yeah, we just had a little music come on. Um, I think we're still a startup in many ways, right? Then we're doing an interview in our space, and then all of a sudden there's music. Anyway, that was fun. Uh, so I was just saying that, yeah, we, we have, so Google has over 10,000 people who review content. And, um, but yes, we, 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 I mean, basically like our process works that we have uh, humans um, that identify, the, we make the policies, we identify content that um, are examples of content that meets the policies or content that doesn't meet the yeah. policies, right? then we use machines to extend that and to go on our platform and to find examples um, of that. And then we use humans to be able to validate those decisions. So everything is really a combination of, of both humans and machines to be able to operate at scale, but also to be able to get it right. Another question was a bit of a niche one, but often I find a lot of content on YouTube in terms of like anything that involves drugs or parkour, like free running, like mm -hmm. gymnastics on buildings, mm -hmm. um, gets demonetized. Mm -hmm. However, film trailers, music videos, all have that content in. So quite a few of my friends have parkour YouTube channels and mm -hmm. things like that, that the entirety of their channel has been wiped for AdSense mm -hmm. for encouraging dangerous behavior. But then you watch a music video from an artist and I'm mm -hmm. like, that couldn't be further from what like even more exaggerated what my friend's doing but that is monetized mm -hmm. um so i was just wondering what what the rule is for situations like that yeah um well so first of all it, you know we we come up with a set of policies for monetization and uh, um those monetization policies just to be Clear, are different than what we have in terms of what's enabled on the platform. So we have community guidelines, yeah. um, and those community guidelines are talk about like we don't enable incitement to violence or hate or adult content, right? Um, and then um, we have a, um, I'll say a higher standard for monetization. Um, and um, part of that has to do, or a big part of that has to do with what advertisers want to have on their platform too. So I think it's really important to remember that um, there's a broad range of advertisers with a broad range of, of desires. And sure. so we have some advertisers who say like, we would like to be 
on um, you know, as many videos as possible that are appropriate. And there'll be a set of content that we all agree will not be appropriate for, for advertising. But um, you know, for the most part, that's, that's a small amount. We try to make it, um, we give advertisers who want it the broadest set of videos. Um, and then we have some advertisers that say, I'm so particular about my brand. I'm so careful and I only want to appear on certain types of content. And they say, I will actually go through and I will actually hand pick the videos or hand pick the channels that I want to show up on. And so that's the broad range that we are handling. Um, and a lot of times when we're looking at, at videos and we're looking um, at what makes sense for monetization, a lot of times it's a reflection of what advertisers want to appear on. And, um, and we're looking at that artistic component of um, what makes sense. And so you know, if you look at a video and it's done by a top, uh, like a, a music artist who has a song that's like one of the top songs, um, you know, that will be taken into consideration from an advertiser standpoint. Sure. Yeah. Um, and um, something that, that some set of advertisers will want to show up on. Um, and so basically we, we look at that artistic component to try to understand what makes sense for advertisers. Is there like a, a group of advertisers that you could pull together that is like, we're up for risky content that could monetize videos with loads of swearing that could monetize promoting dangerous activities like jumping off buildings and stuff. Do you know what I mean? There must <laughs> yeah. be a group of like Red Bull or somebody that's like, we like that. Yeah. So that's a, that's a question and I have gotten that before from advertisers yeah. saying, hey, like we do kind of edgy content. Why can't we have more edgy advertisers? Yeah. Like there must be a lot out there. Um, and the reality is like, it's a lot of times the users who are interested in that content are hard to reach anywhere else. Um, meaning that they have a lot of these contents attract very valuable audiences, mm -hmm. and so we um, we have been working on trying to make do that matchmaking um, and making sure that we can bring um, um, advertisers to the right set of content. Um, so, for example, like I'll give a set of um, advertiser content that doesn't make sense always to show up on all types of content, yeah. which is a lot of times film or horror movie, right? Like mm -hmm. a horror film advertisement like we also need to be careful where that shows up yeah. um, because for there be a set of users that might it could be scary for them to see right yeah. um, but whereas appearing on like a more edgy content could make more sense so that would be an example of the kind of matchmaking that we're thinking about how to do so I just want to let you know I uh, I've also heard this concern that YouTube um, does not enable edgy creators um, to be successful and we want to enable, um, and, and like it's hard for us to generate revenue on the platform, and why have you made those decisions, right? So we hear that, um, and that's why we're trying to find a set of advertisers that would be comfortable with it, and bringing them and matching them with content. And, and, that, um, and I think if we can do that, that's valuable for the advertisers too, because it's oh, content yeah. that otherwise otherwise you know, they, they could be more unique on that content. Yeah. If your video is demonetized, does it affect your view count? Because if if my video, say for example, was a parkour video, mm -hmm. and therefore it wasn't monetized, would it be pushed? There is this like sense in the community that if your video gets demonetized, YouTube don't push it as much because they're not earning from mm -hmm. it. So would I appear on trending? Would I get in recommended? Would I be placed well in the algorithm if I'm creating those style of videos that aren't advertiser friendly, mm -hmm. but are still good for society? because it doesn't benefit YouTube mm -hmm. to be promoting mm -hmm. it because mm -hmm. you're not earning and I'm not earning. Mm -hmm. uh, no. The answer <laughs> is no. Um, I can tell you that. <laughs> um, and, I, and I have heard this question before. Yeah. In fact, there was PewDiePie talked about it in yeah. one of his videos and I commented. Did you? Um, yeah, on, that, on that, that video because it's a really important question and I think there's a lot of confusion yeah. in the ecosystem about this. Um, so just to just... Um, and we actually have a creator insider video. So YouTube, to try to communicate more and try to be more transparent, we created this channel mm -hmm. called Creator Insider, where we have people who work on YouTube and build our products talk about how I've our seen, I've works. seen the channel. Yeah, so Creator Insider also has a video about this. And um, just to be really clear, the systems and the people who create our monetization um, solutions um, are completely separate 
from the people and systems who create our recommendation systems. Like they actually sit in different locations. Um, they report into different people. Um, and since the very beginning, YouTube um, and Google have been really clear about having separation between monetization and, rec promoted, and, yeah. and promotion. Um, and, and always being clear about what is promoted, what's not promoted, you know, this is an ad, yeah. like this is sponsored, um, et cetera. Um, because we've always been focused on making sure we have a good user experience, right? And to have a good user experience, you need to just be, you need to only focus on the user and you only focus on what the user is doing, not necessarily on revenue metrics. So we have a completely separate team that just does revenue metrics and another team that just does users. Let's say you do something that in the video that is, uh, con controversial or considered um, content that should be age gated. Yeah. Okay, like it has, um, I don't know, um, it's inappropriate for minors. Mm -hmm. for, there could be many reasons why yeah. content is inappropriate for minors. So you do something like that. Um, these two systems that are built in different buildings will both pick that up. That there is something in this video that is not appropriate for advertisers yeah. um, and is not. I think one of my recent videos got that. My friend spoke about how he suffered, or oh, used to be an alcoholic mm -hmm. for like a year. Instant mm -hmm. like demonetization, everything. Mm -hmm. um, so I haven't seen that actual video, but mm -hmm. it's very possible, yeah. right? That it would like that. But that fits. That fits. That would be an example saying, for sure. Being, right. That would that would be an example of like yeah. being. And again, I haven't seen the video. Context always matters. But if you're talking about being an alcoholic, it's possible that that's something that. Um, was depending upon what he what details he went yeah. into or what was what was covered is possible that that could be seen as as something appropriate for an older audience mm -hmm. and so and it's possible very possible that our ad system said this isn't something yeah. advertisers want to um, appear on and so the same content like our, our systems would both of that would pick that up and as a result would probably make independent decisions. And so you might look at the video and say, hey, these two are related, but they're not, it's, they're not related because our recommendation system said there's, a, there's been a monetization decision. Yeah, they're yeah. only related because both of our systems picked up the same criteria and the content and made independent decisions about how to promote and how to monetize. So you could be demonetized and pushed hard by YouTube, even though it's demonetized. It's, it's possible. You can have no more moaning to anyone that's demonetized and blames YouTube for the low views. It's, it's possible. Yeah. I mean, again, a lot of times if there is content that's sensitive, we may make for sure. decisions. But I mean, if you turn off monetization and turn it back on or turn it off, turn it no on, difference. like you shouldn't be seeing changes in how our system is recommending you. Actually, Casey had his monetization turned off for the first, was it a year, two years of his channel. Mm -hmm. He said, I don't want any adverts on my channel. Mm -hmm. And he's still done pretty well. Yeah. Switching things up quite a bit. I want to talk about creator and creator harassment mm -hmm. because there's a lot of there's a big new policy coming out soon. Yes. I'd love to know when it's coming out and also what it actually means in terms of what can and what a creator can't do and what counts as harassing another creator and yes. what would happen if you got found harassing another creator yes. in a video. Yes. Okay, these are great questions that I would like to know the answers to all of them too. Um, <laughs> um, I can tell you that we're working on it. Yeah. And let me tell you what that means. Yeah. Okay. Um, so first of all, like, so when I meet with creators, I have heard a lot this issue, right? Like there's a creator who's, who consistently says inappropriate comments about me, um, or has made a video about me that's inappropriate. So I've heard this issue in many different ways. Um, and I think we have seen many, we've seen some high profile examples that we know have been problematic yeah. and, um, and that has caused us to take a really hard look at our harassment policy. Um, and so let me tell you what that means. So we basically, we say like, here's a policy, a lot of people are complaining about it, um, or there's a lot of issues. Um, or, you know, we ourselves identified this is an issue. I mean, it can come multiple ways that we identify something needs review. Um, usually, when we, the way we kick off that process is we say, let's go talk to a number of experts in the area, a number of creators who feel that they have been harassed in this area, um, and we try to understand exactly what the issue is. And we look at a number of videos and we try to say, like, 
does that feel right? Does that feel wrong? And then from that, and based on a lot of this expert advice, we try to figure out, can we crystallize this into a description um, and a set of policies that can be enforced consistently, okay? Now, before I told you that we have, you know, that Google has 10,000 people around the globe, right? So um, doing content moderation. And so we need to make sure that when we come up with a new policy on harassment, that the policy is clear um, and can be enforced. So, so we will, um, after meeting with all these experts, we'll try to define exactly what this new policy looks like. And then we will go to our reviewers and train them on this new policy and see if we give them a hundred different videos, are they going to make, be able to make consistent decisions? Okay, so we would like our, our consistency to be in the high 90s, which means that for any video that we have, when our reviewers see it, that we, you know- Is that 90 robots or human? Humans. Human. That the humans are consistently making the same decisions. Yeah. Okay, and in order to do that, that policy, we have to train people, but the policy also has to be clear, has to be defendable. Um, now, harassment is a really hard, it's a, it's a hard area, it's an emotional area, um, and so we're in the process of, right now we're in the process of talking with different experts and hearing their feedback and hearing about what, um, what changes they would like to make, right, and, and what changes they are, um, they think are necessary for the platform. And it is a challenge because we do see, um, when we look at content, like you, you can look at music, for example, you were talking about music before, you know, and we can see that there's a lot of um, content in there that could have racial slurs, right? Mm -hmm. um, that could be seen as sexist, right? Um, and so, like, just, again, like, you could see that in humor, um, in a variety of different situations. And so what, we've si what we see is that context is incredibly important. Like what was the context of the video? What was the point of the video? Was the point of the video to harass someone or was it a one hour video in which someone was trying to be funny in which they made a number of different comments to different people that could be seen as harassing? And so these are the types of issues that we need to be able to tease out. Um, and we see a lot of, we see that there's a lot of nuance uh, because like they're also I'm just saying there we could get it wrong okay and we could come up with a policy and that policy could mean that a large amount of videos are now in violation there are a large amount of songs a large amount of of humor videos and people would say hey like all these songs are in violation and there would be a lot of content that we'd be removing that potentially could be valuable on the platform and so the, again we don't want to have creator on creator housement but we also need to be able to 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 um, define the policy in a careful way such that we are um, enabling a lot of the free expression um, and a lot of the content that we think is defining for culture, um, but also being sensitive to the issues on creator, creator harassment. So I think the answer to you is like, I still don't know the answers to the questions yeah. you said, and it's because we are in the process of defining exactly yeah. what that is. Because I've been told like, this side of the year kind of thing, that it's gonna be happening. There will be new harassment laws where videos of a creator bashing another creator will not be acceptable on the platform anymore. Because so the people's like whole channels are just built now, tearing each other down, and it benefits the, the person creating the video because they're earning a ton of money. Well, so that, that so, and so it just again, makes me think what the video. platform do I want to be part of that is right. promoting, actively promoting a content, a creator hating another creator right. to benefit no. themselves, not because they hate even the creator. Right. No, I, I, I understand. And, and, um, I, um, we're going to, we will, like our, our goal is to enable our content creators to create valuable content that's beneficial for society, not to be creating a content and, and getting their views by criticizing someone else, right? Yeah. And t trying to take them down in some way and taking someone who is a celebrity and having their whole content and channel dedicated to criticizing that celebrity. So we understand that there are these motives here that are not good for the ecosystem. They're not good for creators. Um, overall, it's not behavior that we want to encourage. So we understand that. But again, the question is like, how would how would you how would we define that 
um, in a way that's that's precise um, that we can make sure that we can enforce it yeah and like we will talk to creators who are concerned we've heard this from creators um, and we're taking it very seriously but we want to make sure that we're doing it in a way that is um, longevity yeah that has longevity that we I mean the worst thing is to the worst thing would be to come out with a rule have that rule be so broad that then everybody is pointing about it we're not enforcing it consistently um, and people feel like our policies have no teeth behind them right mm -hmm. so we need to come out with a policy that we know is clearly um, is enforceable understandable um, and that we can take action on and so again we don't just roll stuff out we we, we do test it we talk to, we talk to experts and then we test it um, and I think it's really important to get that right because yeah. I, I look I understand and, and I'm you know I understand the harassment issue and I understand that that is really a dark, a dark and difficult part um, if that's happening to a creator and it's mm -hmm. not something that we want to encourage um, but the policy, but the policy has to be written in such a way that creators can comment on each other and criticize each 100%. other, right? And and so the question is, how do you draw the difference between creators criticizing each other um, and being part of this free speech and open ideas and um, and then like where where do you draw that line? Where do they cross the line that it's no longer just about ideas, but they're criticizing them as a person, um, criticizing or their channel is based upon that. Um, and so we need to really tease that out in a clear and consistent way. And that's what we're in the process of doing. I, I think we'll have a policy this year, yeah. meaning 2019. Because I think it's just um, such a clash of freedom of, uh, of expression but then freedom to belong. Like I know yeah. so many people that have had so many negative videos made about them that they don't feel like they belong. Right. And I'm like, well, I've had this that's not the goal too. of YouTube, but then the other person should have the freedom sure. of expression. Sure. And I'd love for YouTube to say either, no, freedom of expression trumps it. So you can say that about other creators. Or as a platform, we don't agree with that. Freedom to belong is more important to us in these scenarios. You can't do that. Mm -hmm. But because there is no answer, people are literally like printing money at the moment and YouTube is rewarding it by hating people or just making factually not even mm -hmm. like things that if a newspaper said it about somebody, they'd be sued within like mm -hmm. 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. But because there is no laws around it, it's literally like, a, like the Wild West plus you're just well, making money. Well, we do, we do have a harassment pol policy today. But I've, where we've drawn that line, for me, is not high enough. Yeah. Okay, and I think we all acknowledge that. So to be clear, we do have a harassment policy. We actually have something called the transparency report where we publish the number of videos that we remove every quarter and how many of them are removed for different reasons, whether it's hate or harassment or spam or yeah. adult content. Like So we do publish those numbers and we do remove videos for harassment, um, but I am agreeing with you that the line is not drawn right now in the right place. And that's why we are looking to redraw it. Um, but we, again, we want to draw it carefully, not come out like rushed with a policy, have that be unenforceable, and then have everybody angry because no one's sure anymore what's allowed. Um, and so it is important to draw it correctly. Um, and I've, I've seen videos that I know that are on our platform that I know will no longer be allowed on the platform anymore. There are definitely videos like that that I see as um, examples of content that is really solely dedicated to harassing a, a creator and to me cross the line. Um, but I want to make sure that we're working with the experts and that we understand and we're hearing from creators and we look at all the different use cases and that we address that. And I, it's a very serious issue. Um, yeah. And I understand how upsetting it is for creators. I understand how difficult it is. And we also see that there are, are groups that a lot of times are underrepresented in our society and they may be subject to more definitely, um, definitely. of this harassment. And that's not our intent, right? We talked about the freedom to belong, that we want people, no matter what their background is, to be able to feel that they're, con they're connecting. And if they're feeling like they're coming on the platform and then they're being harassed, then that's the opposite of what we want. So we understand that. Um, 
But again, we just want to be careful on how we draw those policies and we draw it in a careful, thought out way. Perfect. This year? I, I think it will be this year. <laughs> <laughs> Gives us six months, so, so we'll on a on. similar kind of note, yes. next question, um, and I'm not involved in this one myself, but I, I did <laughs> see there's a lot of people that I watch who dealt with this issue, and I think it's still going on, it might be, correct me if I'm wrong, um, family channels that feature their children getting their comments removed yes. because of people looking at the content, mm -hmm. time stamping in the comments, using the comment section to look at children in appropriate ways. Yes. And therefore, YouTube taking all of the comment section out of some family family content creators' channels, in my eyes, doesn't really solve the issue that's taking away the whole community of the channel, mm -hmm. when really it's just a couple of people that should be kicked off the platform. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I can tell you the history of this and why we came to the decision that we did, yeah. which we didn't come to lightly. Um, and so, you know, first of all, protecting children and child safety is probably like the most important thing that we do. For sure. And we, we need to make sure that we are always doing whatever we can to protect children. And that is both children's as viewers, right? Um, YouTube is a 13 plus product and we have YouTube kids and making sure children are safe on our platform, right? And so what we saw just to recap for people who missed it, was we saw that um, there had been videos that were innocently uploaded, like girls doing gymnastics or in swimming, um, and that um, there were a number of people that had timestamped certain parts of the video or creating playlists and putting these videos together, and that consumption in the way that they were, were consuming that content was inappropriate. Yeah. Okay, so we took that incredibly seriously. We made very significant changes to be able to address that. And we did turn off comments for a number of channels that involve um, or that feature young minors um, or feature older minors in potentially more risky behavior like swimming or gymnastics or yeah. dancing, right? So um, like types of behavior that would, that would invite more of that type of, of comments or, or issues. We spent a long time thinking of talking about it and, and the, the, the reality is like, I mean, I think you're right that we did limit the freedom of expression and some of the freedom to belong for those channels. And all um, of their community, there are millions their of people wanting yes. to yes. feedback and chat and communicate. Yes, no, I understand. Um, but the, and and that was like we did that with a lot of reluctance, but but, and it wasn't an easy decision. But on the other hand, we need to make sure we're always protecting kids. And there was we realized that when we had this choice between child safety and freedom of expression and freedom belong, that we had to put child safety at the highest level, even if that meant that videos involving kids do not have the same freedom of expression. In them and that was that was a a difficult decision but you know if we look at kids like your job is to protect them and to keep them safe and and as parents and adults and as a platform that's what we need to do it's important to remember that you know any if we were to reverse that policy right now like how could we um, as hard as it is for creators and I understand that like how could we defend that if if it was pointed out again that there was another child safety issue, like right? And so we always need to make sure that child safety is, is our top priority. And so we are working hard that we can better identify which videos have children and which ones don't and be able to do that at the video level and, and do that consistently and to do that with high accuracy. Um, but we can't, it's not something we can roll out and say, hey, that was like, Partially, you know, that was like 80% yeah, accurate yeah, yeah, or 90% yeah, yeah. accurate. We, we need to make yeah. sure that it's really, really accurate um, and that we're doing it in the right way. And so, I, I mean, I, I sympathize with the channels and I, um, it wasn't a decision that we took lightly. Um, and I'm hopeful again that we can make that decision um, at the video level as opposed to the channel level. But, but to be fair, we're not there yet. Yeah. Um, and I'm hopeful that we, can be. 
you think it'll get to a point where the comments are all back on? Or do you think this is just new version of how YouTube's gonna run now is if you feature young children doing gymnastics, there is just no comments on the video. I think it, the, it's going to be that if you have videos of young children doing gymnastics, there will be not be comments. No comments. But I think we could do it at the channel level. Um, uh, like meaning that the, sorry the chant we could just we could decide it at the video level not the channel level yeah. which means so like I I'm a let's say I'm a family uh, vlogger I have some videos that involve my children those are ones I want to be very careful with the comments but maybe there's one of just me and my spouse and we're talking about something involving parenting um, that doesn't have young children in it that's a way that potentially we can enable comments to be on those videos yeah. right and that way the channel can still get feedback. Um, but it's not about specific children in the video. So again, we're still working on that and some of our decisions today work yeah. at the video level as opposed to the channel level. Um, but is it something you could add into the, when I upload a video on my channel, I've got the feature at the moment where I have to tick the boxes of if I, yes, I have got this, no, I have not sworn in the video, yes, there is a brand deal in the video, or no, there isn't, and therefore. Right. The self-certification. For sure. So could it be another... added into that of like, have you got young minors in the video? Yes or no. Right. So you're referring to a program we have this self certification. Which where is we, the best thing you have done. I'm so I'm so glad. So Love it. so that's a program where we enable creators to tell us what's in the yeah. video and then we say we trust what you tell us is in the video and then we make the right monetization decisions as a result. Um, and so yes, potentially we could do something like that as well for family creators where they tell us like are there these types of situations in your video? Yeah. And if so then and I'm sure they would love that because it's only going to benefit them by looking after their children. Yeah, I, I think, think it just created a lot of confusion it did. instantly. And people are still confused now. It did, and it was hard. And, and a lot of, a lot of um, I mean, we know that community is really important. It's really, really important to, to channels. And we know that those channels don't have an ability for them to communicate with their fans. And so, again, we're working on it. Um, and we know it's a problem. We know that it is uh, a serious issue for creators, um, family creators, and any channel that has children in it. But on the other hand, when we, if we make a change, we need to know that that change is 100% safe for children. And so that's the bar that we will use. Yeah. I mean, I also get people who ask me the question, like, why didn't you, why, I mean, some people, people, well, ask other questions like why? Why didn't you turn off comments sooner? Uh, why don't you turn off comments for everybody? Um, and so, as I know, uh, that would not be a good idea. So again, we're trying to find a way to uh, make comments be, you know, make sure that we can enable it for community and um, and do so in a way that we're also keeping people safe. One thing I wanted to ask about: mm -hmm. What's your opinion? on Instagram taking away the likes. Mm -hmm. um, Not being able to see the metric. You can see it yourself still, but nobody else can see. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's interesting. Um, and one of the things I know from having developed online product for so long is, is that um, decisions are not always intuitive. So I. I, I think it's an interesting idea to understand better, like what are, what are the implications when you do something like that. Um, at YouTube, we actually have like and dislike, right? Um, yeah, that's one of my other questions. Yeah, and so on the community tab, for example, we don't show the dislike number. Yeah. Um, and so I think there are many different ways to be able to um, understand the role those two um, ways of users giving feedback makes sense for our platform overall. So I saw that like what Instagram did was they rolled it out in one country and they tested it and then they rolled it out to more countries. Yeah. Um, and so that generally means they must have seen signs that this was positive for the ecosystem. But I guess I would ask you, I mean, as a creator, how would you feel that your likes are not uh, public? Like, would you feel better about this? Would you? like it that you see the likes but not the dislikes like i mean what would you like to see in terms of instagram i think for me i think it's going to be super interesting like i'm really excited i want them to enroll that because mm -hmm. i can't even imagine 
being 13 and in school and having to get more or less likes than other friends or mm. some super popular kid in the class likes your picture and then they're like, oh, now it's public, everyone can see that. Why have they like that? Is it, is it, are they taking the mick out of me? Like, I, I don't think likes being visible has any positivity um, at all. Yeah, I don't How about the dislikes? Literally one of the other questions I've got written, written down is what is the point of the dislike? Because I don't, again, I don't see any positive effect of having a dislike, unless it's a metric that you genuinely track and you honestly believe that when somebody presses dislike, it's because they don't actually enjoy the video, mm -hmm. which I personally don't think anybody has ever used that button for. Mm -hmm. It's more of like a, as soon as a creator uploads a video, dislike, go back off. Mm -hmm. Nobody, unless I'm wrong, maybe from your looking into the data, I can't imagine people properly watching a creator that they like and going, didn't actually like this video too much of you, but I'll still watch your next one. This yeah. like to show I didn't like that piece of content. Yeah. yeah. Like, I, is there a purpose for the dislike yeah. button? Is it actually useful for YouTube? And what are the benefits of having it? Yeah. Um, well, I think it started out because we wanted people to give us feedback on the videos. Right, and we wanted people to tell us what they liked and what they didn't like. Um, but I think you're right that there can be a lot of abuse with it, um, and um, like I think it, there are um, ways to potentially, you know, rethink some of that. And so I, you know, I don't want to commit here what we're going to do because I like to be very thoughtful about our plans going forward, but I think it's definitely something that we're gonna spend time looking at and understanding what role do these two signals play and what makes sense for us to highlight or not highlight. Um, and again, like on community tab, we show the like number, but not the dislike number. Is um, there a dislike to press, but you just there can't is, see it? There is. Yeah, and we know it, but we don't we don't share it. Do, do I see it myself if I want to look again? No, I don't think so. I don't think so as a creator. You don't see it. Wow. Um, so, um, so I mean, I'm just saying there are many models, and actually, yeah. like, you know, before we were talking about harassment, I mean, there are also product changes that you can make that will be impactful for people in terms of how we think about harassment and how we think about what discourages people from being on the platform, what discourages them from having a channel and sharing their point of view and we want to be sensitive to that so um, you know I just want you to I just want you to know I I've I have been thinking about that um, but I don't have any feature change to report at this time maybe soon though maybe we would we would I think what you would hear first, there's no benefit from having it well I think what you would hear first I think there is some benefit people like to know like so many people like my video um, oh, no, I'm talking about the dislike button. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I mean, people like to dislike our re last rewind video, right? And <laughs> that's, that's my last question. <laughs> and that, um, you know, people seem to really yeah. enjoy that. But I think yeah. that that might be like an edge case. Um, and most people, yeah. um, it's you know, it's unclear what they're saying with the with the like it, like whether the dislike video really means they really disliked or did they have some kind of yeah. material motive so um so you know we'll look at that and understand it probably like what you would hear first or what experiments are we running and similar to what you saw with other platforms like we might do it in a country or yeah and see like well what happens what do the creators say like are all the creators really upset are they all angry saying like i'm not getting good feedback are they saying no i'm really happier so you take the likes away as well well, I haven't defined, we haven't defined the experiment, but yeah. we could, we could run multiple experiments. We could run an experiment where we take away the dislikes, right. where we take away the likes and the dislikes, where we show it in the interface to the creator, but not to the public, yeah. where we don't even show it to the, like maybe we don't even show the creator the dislikes. I mean, there are lots of, like, we don't have a dislike button. There are many permutations yeah. that we could run and, and we would like to see um, I would want to spend some time understanding what experiments we want to run and then like hear from the people in that country like what, what was good and what yeah. was bad about it. I think the like button is only a positive feature, but I do think that especially with like Instagram, the amount of like mental health 
that that one metric carries for young, mm. for specifically young people, yeah. is outweighs the that side of it outweighs the positive. And I definitely think removing mm-hmm. that will be super interesting to see the effect that it has. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I actually got asked quite a lot by my friends that make videos. Do YouTube do anything or are they looking to do anything proactively to help creators who are suffering from mental health mm-hmm. at all? Is there any kind of um, organization or anything that YouTube could mm-hmm. fund or run or help fund mm-hmm. um, that would help creators who are finding it difficult being online? Yeah. Uh, so, so uh, well, overall, mental health first of all is like a big topic on YouTube, right? So we have many creators that address this issue overall, mm-hmm. um, and it's a it's a topic that we have a lot of creators who talk about it openly, talk about their own mental health challenges, and um, and I think it's really important, right, to be aware of that and to be sensitive to those issues and and be open about it so we can find solutions to solve it. Um, with YouTube and creators specifically. A lot of times there's this issue around creator burnout like the and creators feeling the need to keep uploading and uploading and they get in a cycle where they don't feel like they can always stop and they yeah. worry if they do stop will they lose their fans and what will happen um, we do have a creator academy video on creator burnout to address it um, we have talked about it at some of the different creator events that we've had where we've brought in different experts and different events to be able to address it um, and, you know, I think one of the questions I got even just on this tour that I think would be interesting, which I'd like us to do more, is be more um, analytical about the impact of upload with um, fans. So, like, if, if people, if I want creators to be able, I want to be able to tell creators, like, if you do take a break or if you change your upload, this is what we've seen across our platform with regard to impact on your channel, impact on um, viewability, subscribers, yeah. et cetera. And again, it's not necessarily what we're gonna change or do, it's just what does our system, how does our system currently work? Yeah. And and um, so, so creators have more information on that. And so we do think it's a really important issue and um, it would be, you know, it would be great for us to, to um, continue to work. And I mean, if you have any specific issue any specific suggestions I'd be open to those are there specific things you think we should be doing to address creator burnout that we are not doing in terms of creator burnout I I definitely think like some stats around having a break would be really beneficial Mm -hmm. yeah Um, I have a lot of friends that have just made continuous some people even like six videos a day for Mm -hmm. like eight years like I don't know what would happen if I stopped (laughs) I just can't One of our friends described it, and I'd never forget this, uh, daily vlogging as like, you're in like a old fashioned train and you're just shoveling the coal. Yeah. And he's like, if I stop shoveling, I don't know where I'm going to end up. I don't know how long I'm going to carry on going for. I've just got to get the daily upload going and that's it. And it's just like in some system that runs. Whereas if you look at more traditional versions of similar-ish jobs of musicians, they do an album, they have a break. Mm -hmm. They do a tour, they have a break. Mm -hmm. I don't know what would happen to PewDiePie's channel if he took six months off. Mm-hmm. But neither does he. And maybe that's too scary to do. Yeah. So, I, but maybe the really answer is you do the data and you're like, no, you can have three months off and it doesn't affect it at all. And then everyone starts having yeah. breaks. Yeah, well, I'm, our, I, I think first of all, we want to do more data analysis. I think that's the first thing. and. Um, like some creators have suggested to me something where you could say, hey, I'm on a break, um, like pause, like can I just pause my account, right? And say, like pause, I'm on a break, um, like freeze everything, I'll be back. Um, so I don't know what that really means, like and yeah. could, could that really happen and what would that mean for, I mean, users are coming every day looking for content, right? So. Mm. Um, but there, but again, I'm really open to those ideas. Where I, and the first step is to really try to give creators more data about what we are currently seeing. And so we actually already have some research on this that our uh, that our creator insider channel did a video on, um, where they dispel some of the myths 
But again, I think it's a good area for us to look into and publish more data for creators so they really understand if they take a break, the impact for their channel. Um, but I recommend to look at that Creator Insider video um, that has that initial research and that does dispel some of the myths around taking a break. Okay, last question I've got. Okay. What are the plans this year for Rewind? Yeah. Um, okay, so Rewind um, became the most disliked video ever. Um, and uh, like we definitely are aware of that. <laughs> uh, um, we definitely realized we did not get it right. Really sorry. I know it's a highly anticipated moment. Um, so I will tell you, we have not finalized plans yet for Rewind. Yeah. But uh, the recommendation of the team, which I think is consistent with my recommendation of what we should do, is to go back to our Rewind roots. Okay, so Rewind started as just um, a review of what some of the top moments of the year were on YouTube. And um, I'd like us to do that um, and just um, be true to whatever the data says, like whether they were good moments or bad moments, like yeah. just say, look, these were the biggest moments. Okay. Um, and so that's, that's where I think we're headed is to just go back to initial rewind roots and to do that on a factual basis. So, um, but still take, stay tuned. We'll update you more as we know more. Okay. I'm but we know that the, we know that video did not work. We got the message <laughs> every way possible. I heard that too at home. From your kids. Cringy. That's what they said. <laughs> cringy. The video was cringy. So, um, did they just like it? Yeah, your probably. <laughs> probably they just liked it. And, and um, so, look, I mean, we make mistakes. We said this was the most disliked video. And yeah. we put out, we even put out playlists of people dissing our video. And I mean, we just accepted it and we're learning and moving on. Sure. Okay. Is there anything else that you, any other questions that you would like to cover? Anything that you want to put out that you feel either isn't already out there or maybe people aren't aware of, but is out there, but you want to emphasize on? Um, um, well, first of all, I just want to say thank you for taking time. And uh, my goal really is to explain what's happening at YouTube, like that there are, there are real people behind YouTube and we really care about our creators and we really care about um, doing the right thing and I know it doesn't always seem that way and sometimes there's confusion about what's happening but we are working really hard to explain um, and to do the right thing and and I want to thank all the creators who are building a business on YouTube and um, creating these next generation companies and we're incredibly proud of the work that, that you and so many creators have done. So thank you for taking the time today and I'll do more creator interviews going forward. But thank yeah. you. No, me. thank you. Thank you for on your family holiday as well and stopping by the space and uh, just building a platform that I've wanted to be part of 10 years and still want to be part of. I'm so glad. I'm looking yeah. forward to the next, the next 10 years. Um, and actually, so how do you think your channel will evolve? Hmm, interesting one. Um, I don't know, I think probably more longer form content. Mm -hmm. I feel that YouTube in general, as, as the audience has grown bigger and bigger, it's more of a scary place to put as much of your life out. Like I filmed every day for four and a half years and put it up the next day. So like strict daily vlogging for four and a half years. And it's so vast now and just everybody uses it. I'm like, I don't know if I want to be doing that. And also at what point do I stop? Mm -hmm. So I stopped about a year ago now and I've just been focusing on maybe like two or three videos a week that are uh, some around my life and some longer form. But I think definitely the longer form videos going forward will be more my thing. But then saying that, people have watched me and my life. I don't know, we'll just see what happens. I don't think I'd film my children. Definitely put that there. I wouldn't film my kids. Mm -hmm. So. I think it'd be really interesting to. to see how it evolves, right? We have a lot of YouTubers and people change over the course of their life and, mm -hmm. and like their channels. I expect their channels to change too. So, yeah. um, well, anyway, I'm looking forward to seeing 
how your channel evolves and grows and best of luck to you and thank you so much for thank you for taking the time well thank you thank you for okay. that oh yeah these as well yeah, 10 years 10 years big change uh, yeah <laughs> thank you i like your hair better now. my hat <laughs> <laughs> just finished up that was good i feel like i'm coming outside and it's like a different day we literally just recorded hey look there's zoe there's Joe. Hey, how's it going? Yeah. Another picture going in. Of course. <laughs> awesome. So nice to see you. See you later. Do I look older? Because we just recorded for so long. Like, I thought having an hour of Susan's time, that's what was dedicated originally, was unbelievable and incredibly great of her. We literally spoke for probably half an hour before, just chatting, catching up, having some lunch together. And then literally recorded for like, so, I mean, you just saw the length of the bloody video if you're still watching. So, super appreciate it, YouTube. Thank you so much for setting up. I hope, let's sit down here from carrying this. I hope, fingers crossed, that I answered the majority, if not all, I bloody hope, of the questions that you wanted me to ask. I dig, did as much digging as possible to get the correct answers. I thought Susan answered everything super authentically super real super honest if she didn't have an answer to a question that i asked she legit said i wish i knew the answer like i don't know how she could have been more honest and more real and i hope watching as a creator or a viewer you super appreciate that because having the ceo of a company at that scale giving me the opportunity to sit down and ask anything i want with no limits with no editing approval no limiting the questions beforehand is a bloody rare thing so susan super appreciate it appreciate she just bought me a load of cakes as well to celebrate my 10 years on youtube and i got my little picture frames that she got me uh, of me before and after so overall i think i'm just gonna leave it here thank you susan thank you youtube for the last 10 years for making youtube so special such a great platform i have bloody high hopes for the future of YouTube. I think it's only getting better and better as a platform and I know that whether you think it or not about everything, they do have our interests at heart. I do genuinely believe that after meeting Susan today for the second or third time I've met her, but probably get to sit down and chat and film everything. Um, yeah, I have big faith for YouTube. Appreciate it for the opportunity. It's Friday night. Let's get home. See you in a bit.